chapter 1. And I have a number of places that I'd like you to go with me as we go through the scripture lesson tonight if you're able to get there quickly. And uh, we're not talking to little people. I mean, you're old enough and you've been in it long enough. You should have known the books of the Bible are, right? 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 11. Seeing then that all these things shall be dissolved, what manner of persons ought we to be? And all holy conversation and godliness. Amen. In the book of Revelation, chapter 1, look at verse 11. Saying, I am Alpha and Omega, the first and the last. And what thou writest in a book, send it unto the seven churches which are in Asia. Unto Ephesus, unto Smyrna, unto Pergamos, unto Thyatira, unto Sardis, and unto Philadelphia, and unto Laodicea. And I turned to see the voice that spake with me, and being turned, I saw seven golden candlesticks. And in the midst of the seven candlesticks, one like unto the Son of Man, clothed with a garment, down to the foot, and girt about the paps with a golden girdle. His head and his hairs were white as wool, as white as snow, and his eyes were as a flame of fire, and his feet like unto fine brass, as if they burned in a furnace, and his voice as the sound of many waters. And he had in his right hand seven stars, and out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword, and his countenance was as the sun shineth in his strength. And when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead, and he laid his right hand upon me, saying unto me, Fear not, for I am the first and the last. I am he that liveth and was dead. And behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. And I have the keys of death and uh, hell and death. Write the things which thou hast seen, and the things which are, and the things which shall be hereafter. The mystery of the seven stars which thou sawest in my right hand and the seven golden candlesticks, the seven stars are the angels in his right hand of the seven churches and the seven candlesticks which thou sawest are the seven churches. Let us pray. Father, we are bowing our heads tonight and thanking you for how that you loved us. Give us of your peace and your presence. Pray, Father, your will to be done tonight. Each one this year to be an open hearer of the word of God, that your word would speak to us, deal with us, straighten us up, convict and trouble, or strengthen and encourage us. I pray, Father, that you'll just grant us your presence and your peace. Help us to be found pleasing to you in the things we say and do. I ask, Father, for your healing and your help, God, in this old body tonight, Father, for these sinuses and uh, the throat and all that's going on with it. I pray for your sustaining power, lifting up and giving what's needed tonight. Lord, we're ever going to praise you and thank you for your abiding hand in our lives. And Father, that you're an ever-present, working, blessing, caring Jesus. I thank you for it. Have your way. In Christ we pray. Amen. A number of times in Revelation chapter 1, we talked about uh, the Lord, and there's no question about it. He said, I am the first and the last. Amen. That's Jesus tonight. He said, I am the one that he was living and was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore. It's Jesus that we're talking about. The Bible talks about, he makes mention of his right hand or in his hand of the things that are in the hand of God, and that's what I want us to talk about, of uh, that which is in the hand of God. In the process of thinking about the service tonight and the message, I thought about how that it is with me. Now, I've got some talent and some ability, and yet with what I'm able to do, there are others who are completely fitted to whatever that their job is. I think about those that handle a cattle, uh, those that do mechanic work, uh, those that do a carpentry and all that kind of stuff. While I can piddle or meddle, depending on how you feel about it, in all of those things, they're not my forte. 
that I'm not going to do the best job at them. There are others more suited for it. It's the reason tonight that I say it like that because what do birds do? They inhabit the air, amen? What does a, 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 an insect do? It inhabits the ground. So I mean, those things that are fitted for their purpose have more ability in those things than someone is not. You can take a worm and throw it up in the air. It's not going to fly away. Amen. And you can take a bird and clip its wings and you put it on the ground and it's still want to going to fly. Amen. And so it's going to do that. But I thought about in the hand of God, the ability and the power and the might that's in the hand of God. Now let me kind of place this in parentheses and give you a couple of verses of scripture to go with that so you can get a jest of what I'm talking about. Exodus chapter uh, 13 and verse 14. And so uh, God is getting ready through uh, the Passover and through letting Israel go out of Egypt and he's going to deliver uh, the uh, firstborn out of all of the families of Egypt in that area who are not covered by the blood. They're going to die. Uh, there's lambs going to die and their blood's going to be shed for the Jewish people and for everybody that applies the blood to the doorpost and to the top part of it, amen. When they get inside that house, they're going to have a blood covering. And so look at verse 13 and verse 14 of chapter 13. And every uh, firstling of an ass thou shalt redeem with the lamb, meaning a lamb's got to die in the uh, ass's place. And if thou wilt not redeem it, thou shalt break its neck. And all the firstborn of men among thy children shalt thou redeem. Verse 14. And it shall be when thy son asketh thee in time to come, saying, What is this? That thou shalt say unto him, Now the son's going to ask, Why are you doing these things? What purpose is it? Teach me why you do this. And he's going to say, What is it that thou shalt say unto him by strength? Of hand, the Lord brought us up, uh, brought us out of from Egypt, from the house of bondage. So, the, by the hand of God, uh, they're going to be delivered from bondage. Now, Deuteronomy chapter three and verse twenty-four. Deuteronomy chapter three and verse twenty-four. Are uh, we getting to the place where that Moses is going to rehearse the law? He's going to retell them what God has already told them. And he's going to give them a little bit of Genesis. Going to give them a little bit or a great deal of Exodus. Going to give them Leviticus and Numbers. All of that's going to be compiled together for the last of the book of Moses. The five of them. And there it is in Deuteronomy. And he's telling him, uh, rehearsing to Israel what he's got in mind. And then look at the... Uh, Verse 24, O Lord God, thou hast begun to show thy servant thy greatness and thy mighty hand for what God is there in heaven or in earth that can do according to thy works and according to thy might. The power that God has in his hand. Now, I'm not going to cover everything tonight that God is able to do because of his power and his might. But remember in the Old Testament, when God brought Egypt, uh, uh, Israel out of Egypt, that he did it by his strong and his uplifted arm. Amen. By the hand. The extension of it. Let me go back to Revelation uh, chapter 1. Some of the things that are in the Lord's hand. Well, we read to you how that whenever that he turned, John did turn to see the voice, the one of the voice, verse 12, being turned, I saw seven golden candlesticks light in the midst of the seven candlesticks, one like the Son of Man, talking about Jesus, clothed with a garment down to the foot. He was in his priestly attire and girt about the path with a golden girdle, which separated him from any earthly priest by his appearance. Verse 14, his head and his hairs were white as wool, uh, white like wool, as white as snow. And so we're talking about somebody that is the ancient of days that has lived and is 
experience. And as I mentioned this morning, the white hair was a sign of decay. Here it is a sign of honor. It is a sign of glory. It is a sign of majesty. Look at verse 15. And his feet like unto fine grass as if they burned in a furnace. Talks about the altar and judgment. And his voice as the sound of many waters. Meaning that when he speaks, you're going to hear him. And he had in his right hand the hand of authority, the hand of power, the hand of honor, the hand of uh, majesty, seven stars. The seven stars he described for us in just a moment. And out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword. We know that as the word of God. And his countenance was as the sun shineth in his strength. H-I-S. How many else's Bible, your Bible, does it have H-I-S in that? And is it capital there? Capital H-I-S? And we're talking about Jesus again and his shining, his brightness. And then he said in verse 17, And when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead. Meaning he humbled himself, he lowered himself, that he might lift up in his humility, Jesus Christ, and he laid his right hand upon me in what's in the hand of God tonight. And he saying unto me, Fear not, I am the first and the last. I am he that liveth and was dead. And behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. And have the keys of hell and of death. Write the things which thou hast seen, and the things which are, and the things which shall be hereafter. By the authority and the hand of God, what's going to happen in the latter days, in the tribulation period. The mystery of the seven stars which thou sawest in my right hand, uh, and the seven golden candlesticks, the seven stars are the angels. Now, whether that's the pasture or each church has a guardian angel, the word angel there means messenger, a divinely sent individual with the word of God. So you can take it either way. It doesn't take away from anything that I'm going to say or what John's going to say. If it's the pastor, pray God for it to be thought of as an angel if he deserves it. And if he doesn't, shame on him for taking that glory. Then the next thing he has, the seven golden candlestick which are the seven churches. Here's the point I want to make before I go any further. The church, the pastor, the preacher, the messenger, and the angel, regardless what it is, needs to be in the hand of God. He is the authority of the message and in the church to bring forward the light of the Word of God. It's not my light. It's not my sword. It's the Word of God by the authority of God you don't have to listen to me tonight. You don't have to pay attention to anything I say. You can completely disregard the word of God if that's what you want to do. But my friend, understand this. One day God's going to open this book and he's going to judge you by the things written by his word. And it's going to be by the authority of the two-edged sword that comes out of his mouth. In other words, you're going to be judged by the word of God. Amen. So in the hand of God, let's go to the book of Isaiah, uh, chapter 7. I hope that you took me to heart when I said I had some places. I'd like you to go with me. One of those is Isaiah, uh, chapter 7. Going to read a little bit here, and then we're going to move on. In the hand of God, things that are fitted for the hand of God. Just a few things. Because there are numbers of things that the Bible uh, talks about that are in the hand of God. Do you remember why you're turning to the book of Isaiah chapter 7? Uh, whenever that God told Moses to go into Egypt and to tell Pharaoh that I sent you, Moses said, how should I know that, that I can tell them that they've got a witness of it? God said, what? What is it in, what is that in your hand? What is that in your hand? Amen. What have you got? And so God's going to use what Moses had to bring about his glory. God is going to use what's in his hand to bring forward his glory. It's going to be a witness and a testimony to understand that God has the power. He has the authority. It's in his hand. It's got, he's got his might. It is his to do with. It. It's in his hand. Hand. So look at uh, Isaiah uh, chapter 7. Let's start reading with verse 17. And the Lord shall bring thee and upon thy people 
and upon thy father's house days that have not come from the day that Ephraim departed from Judah. Isn't it amazing, friend, uh, that a lot of times, in fact, most of the times, when we read the word Edom, referring to the tribe of Israel, that was one of the largest in the uh, family of Jacob, that it's often spoken of in a bad light. It's not a good light that is given. And so it goes on. Uh, the day that Ephraim departed from Judah, even the king of Assyria. And it shall come to pass in that day that the Lord shall hiss, meaning a sign of discouragement, a sound of discouragement, for the fly that is in the uttermost part of the rivers of Egypt, and for the bee that is in the land of Assyria. Now God's going to use these things. Here's how he's going to use them. And they shall come and shall rest, all of them, in the desolate valley, meaning the bee and the fly, or Assyria, is going to come, and he said, in the valley, and in the holes of the rocks, and upon all thorns and upon all bushes. None of these things are going to deter them because they are going to be used by God. Verse 20. In the same day shall the Lord shave with a razor that is hired. Or in other words, God is going to borrow Assyria to bring judgment upon his people. And my friend, because of their disobedience, because they departed from him, not just Ephraim, but all those others that fall under that same kind of a judgment, it was good for them then, it's still good for us tonight. If you're falling away and straying from God, his judgment is going to be used upon you. God may use a flood, God may use a tornado, God may use a neighbor, God may use anything else, but God is going to use Assyria by his hand and going to bring judgment on Ephraim, on Israel, because they departed from Judah, meaning God. They departed from it. And so God, in verse 20, is going to borrow a razor with his hand, and he's going to shave. And he said, namely, of them beyond the river by the king of Assyria. Assyria is the razor. And he's going to, it's very sharp, he's going to use it, the head and the hair of the feet, and it shall all also consume the beard. And so God is going to use Assyria to cut Israel clean, as if they were clean shaven with a very sharp razor, meaning that God's judgment is going to be sure. You might play games with God, and a lot of folks may play games with God, and they may act like they can do anything and get by with it, but God expects us to take his word seriously. Amen. We may mock at him. We may think it's no big deal, sin, no big deal, but God considers sin to be a great, big deal. The Bible said that sin is a stench in the nostrils of God. It is an abhorrent thing. It's something that would make God turn away. It's something that would drive God away. Sin is a stench in the nostrils of God. I don't know if anybody here has ever smelled a burning flesh, but it's a stinky thing, amen? And so that's why God, in the Old Testament, when they burned a sacrifice on the altar, they added salt to it, they added uh, different spices to it, and the idea is that when they would have prayer time, in the temple, when they would take coals off of the altar and go to the uh, holy place, not the most holy, and they would put the coals on there, that they would sprinkle incense on it, and it would be a sweet-smelling Savior before God. They represented prayers of repentance and thanksgiving. Here it is. God says sin is a stench in the nostrils of God. So God's going to use Assyria by his hand to bring judgment. It's not an accident. Amen. It's not by someone else's idea. The king of Assyria didn't come up with this idea his own. Amen. God is going to use it to bring judgment. We might think, I've had someone tell me, say this, that's just not right. That's just not fair. I'll tell you this when I told them. God knows what the future holds. God knows that he's got to bring judgment. And by his hand, the Bible said, if you're without chastisement, then are you bastards and not sons. So I would rather be whipped by the hand of God than to go blind on in the judgment and meet my end. And God say, depart from me, you workers of iniquity, 
I never knew you. Amen. So God is going to use the enemy of Israel to humble them and to conquer their pride in the hand of God. Let's go to Revelation chapter 5. Now back to the book of Revelation chapter 5. And in Revelation chapter 5, let's read from verse 1. And I saw in the right hand of him, talking about God now, that sat on the throne of book written within and on the backside sealed with seven seals. And I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, who is worthy to open the book and to loose the seals thereof? Good question, amen. And no man in heaven, nor in earth, neither under the earth, was able to open the book, neither to look up thereon. And I wept much, this is John talking about how it troubled him, that nobody was able to unloose that book and let him know what was in it. Because no man was found worthy to open and to read the book, neither to look thereon. Let me go ahead and interject this. All the prophets that died righteous, all of the disciples in the early church that died righteous, none of them were worthy to open the book. It takes a sinless one to open the book. This book let me say it like this, is the title deed to the earth. It's God's, amen? So the earth is God. He says in another place the heavens are his, says in another place that the cattle, he owns them all on all the hill, a thousand hill. They belong to him. So the earth, the book is the title deed to the earth. It's his. God made the world. He made the creation. He made the universe. He made the sun, the moon, the stars, the planets. God made it all. Amen. While I'm here in six days. Amen. And then he didn't do anything on the seventh day but rest. So who can do all that in one day? Just God. Amen. Just God can do it. That's what he's telling us. That's what he's trying to get across. And so he said, no one was able to open and to loose the seals. I wept much because of it. No one could either look thereon. And, verse 5, one of the elders said unto me, weep not. Behold, the line of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, they have prevailed to open the book and to loose the seven seals thereof. Once again, there should be no question, as it was in chapter 1, it is in chapter 5. The one that was found worthy is Jesus Christ. He's the one that is able to open the book and to loose the seals thereof. Verse 6, And I beheld, and lo, in the midst of the throne, and of the four beasts, in the midst of the elders, stood a lamb as had been slain, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God, sent forth into all the earth, that is the perfection of Jesus Christ. And he came, Jesus did, and he took the book out of the right hand of him, God, that sat upon the throne. So who is worthy to loose the seals of the title deed to the earth? Jesus Christ. It's in his hand tonight. And he's going to reveal to John things which must shortly come to pass. The word of God, the trouble that this old world is going to get into. This morning in our Sunday school lesson, I believe it was, and in a little bit of the reading that I did, it talked about how that God's going to do things that have never been done before. Going to do some things that no one else has ever seen before. The book of Revelation is that book. Amen. What he's going to do, and he's going to have things done that no man has ever seen thereof. In fact, if you study the seals that are loose, each one builds upon the other, and things just get worse and worse and worse in the tribulation period. So God is getting ready to reveal his judgment on earth to those that have rebelled against him by judgment to proclaim that Israel and in the book of Revelation, the nation of the Jewish people of Israel have strayed from him. He's going to do what he takes there to bring them back to him. Paul told the Romans that Israel, a remnant of them, shall be saved. That's what Isaiah said. That he was going to bring forward a remnant. A remnant's the end bolt of the cloth. They miss what's left. Now, Jeremiah talked about that. Now, that God's going to bring judgment. They're going to go to Babylon, but there would be a remnant return. Uh, Nehemiah and Ezra talked about that remnant that returned. They went through their judgment. They stayed in Babylon. They paid for their sin. God brought them back to Israel, at least a remnant that he did, and it was by his strong and uplifted arm that he did it. Let's go back 
in the Old Testament one more time to the book of Amos. Amos chapter 7. <coughs> Some things that are in the hand of God. <coughs> I like this one uh, because it's not something we talk about all the time. Amos chapter 7, and we'll start reading with verse 7. Thus he showed me, and behold, the Lord stood upon a wall made of a plumb line, and a plump with a plumb line in his hand. And the Lord said unto me, Amos, what seest thou? And I said, Amos said, a plumb line. Then said the Lord, Behold, I will set a plumb line in the midst of my people Israel. I will not again pass by them anymore. And the high places of Isaac shall be desolate, and the sanctuaries of Israel shall be laid waste, and I will rise against the house of Jeroboam with the sword. Now Jeroboam was the uh, fellow that uh, after Solomon's kingdom was divided that went north and he took and went up there with the ten tribes. Rehoboam stayed in the south with Judah and Benjamin. And so God is telling him by his hand he's going to bring judgment against the uh, northern neighbor uh, family of Israel, Jeroboam's uh, people, those that preceded every king after him, remember that if you study the nation of Israel, the top ten, there was not one good king found in that entire uh, reign of, of that kingdom. Not one good king. Some were worse than others, and some had some fleeting good moments, fleeting good moments, but there was not one finally over all righteous king of the nation of Israel. And God is going to use his standard. That's what he's saying here. And this is in the minor prophets, <coughs> the less than quality or volume wise of the prophets. And he said, Thus he showed me, behold, the Lord stood upon a wall. The wall here is Israel, it's the nation of Israel. And so he said, made by plumb line. God made Israel with the plumb line, with a straight line. In other words, God set a standard. God set a standard, and now he's standing on the wall that he made with a plumb line to see how straight they were, to see how they measured up. That's what he's done. He's got the plumb bob, the plumb line in his hand, and he's measuring how straight that they are. <coughs> the problem is, because of their idolatry and falling away from God, that the wall, Israel, which was once upright, has started to teeter. It started to fall. Amen. And so God is on the wall. He's got a plumb line. And then he goes off by a plumb line. He made the wall with a plumb line. With a plumb line in his hand. The plumb line is God's law. God's truth. And God's holiness. And he's going to judge Israel. The wall. By that standard. Amen. Now it's easy enough. If you measure yourself by someone else. Measure yourself by me. At times, no doubt, you look pretty good. Measure yourself by someone else that you know. At times, no doubt, you'll probably look pretty good. And that's what the religious world is trying to do today. Measure themselves by someone else. Amen. But the Bible said, be ye followers of Jesus Christ. That's the one that we're going to have to meet his standard. You don't have to meet my standard. I'm just a man. Amen? Yeah, a preacher and a person that's a Christian who's trying to live the life that God has given me, that I might bring glory to the snake. Amen? But you need to meet the standard of God. And he's not going to lower it. He's not going to accept it leaning. Amen? God knows I'm just human. He'll accept me as a leader. No, friend, if you're playing horseshoes, you get point for leaning, but not as a Christian. Amen. God expects you to meet that standard that he set forward. He's judging Israel by the plumb line. Amen. And he finds that they're not where they need to be. And the Lord said unto me, Amos, what seest thou? And Amos said, I see a plumb line. Then said the Lord, behold, I will set a plumb line in the midst of my people Israel. And then he says this because of what he sees. I will not again pass by them anymore. They failed until they repent. I'm done with them. Until they get humbled down, I'm done with them. And the plumb line was in God's hand. He didn't put it in my hand. 
then put it in your hand. Amen. We can't wave it and think we're going to get by. Can you just imagine a plumb bob, uh, which is what we're talking about, is meant to show exact straight gravity's pull and the center so that you can mark your walls, your doors, your frame, whatever you need to do, by that plumb bob. And you can imagine it in our hands and in a carpenter's hands and do pretty good. But know this as a fact tonight. If God's got it in his hand, it's going to be exact. Amen. Amen. It's going to be right. Be no wavering on it. And so it's not in man's hand. It's not in the king's hands. It's not in the president's hands. It's not in the senate and Congress's hands. Amen. I mentioned them fellas this morning, didn't I? It's not in their hands. It's in God's hand. He expects us to meet his standard. We can't expect him to meet all of us. Amen? That's what he's talking about. How do you measure up? It's easy to meet the world's standard. Now, there's people all over in churches and outside of churches and once was in church and once out of church and uh, there's people that just in church during election time and there's people that's in church when there's wars being fought, when their loved ones are getting ready. But my friend, how are you and how do you measure up all the time? Amen. That's what God's wanting to find out tonight about our lives and where we are with Him. I mentioned Zechariah this morning. Go there with me. Zechariah chapter 13. One of the larger of the minor prophets of the big boys. Zechariah chapter 13. Got to start reading with verse 1. And then read through the entire chapter. Thir uh, nine verses. In that day there shall be a fountain opened to the house of David and to the inhabitants of Jerusalem for sin and for uncleanness. We'll make mention of these when I come back through them. And it shall come to pass in that day, saith the Lord of hosts, that I will cut off the names of the idols out of the land, and they shall no more be remembered. And I also, and also I will cause the prophets and the unclean spirit to pass out of the land. And it shall come to pass that when any shall yet prophesy, then his father and his mother that begot him shall say unto him, Thou shalt not live, for thou speakest lies in the name of the Lord. And his father and his mother that begot him shall thrust him through when he prophesy. It shall come to pass in that day that the prophet shall be ashamed every one of his vision. When he hath prophesied, neither shall they wear a rough garment to deceive. But he shall say, I am no prophet, I am an husbandman. For man taught me to keep cattle from my youth. And one shall say unto him, What are these wounds in thy hand? When he shall answer those which thou, those that with which I was wounded in the house of my friends. Uh, verse 7, Awake, O sword, against my shepherd, and against the man that is my fellow. Saith the Lord of hosts, smite the shepherd, and the sheep shall be scattered. And I will turn my hand uh, upon the little one. It shall come to pass in all the land, saith the Lord. Two parts there shall be cut off and die, but the third part, uh, the third shall be left uh, therein. And I will bring the third part through the fire, and will refine them as silver is refined. And will try them as gold is tried. And they shall call on my name. And I will hear them. I will say it is my people. And they shall say the Lord is my God. Go back to verse 1. What's going to happen? There's going to be a fountain open. And that fountain was opened by Jesus Christ on the old rugged cross. Amen. Don't you just love the cross tonight? There's not any other symbol of death that I appreciate. No other symbol of death that I find any glory in. No other symbol of death that I find anything that there's any reason in the world that somebody might promote it. But I thank God for the old rugged cross. Amen. That Ethan sung about uh, this morning. The old rugged cross stained with blood. So divine. Amen. I'll cherish the old rugged cross. And so he said in verse 1, there will be a fountain open uh, to the house of David, talking about Jesus, to the inhabitants of Jerusalem for sin and for uncleanness, meaning that that fountain is going to cleanse sin and uncleanness. Verse 2, you shall come to pass in that day, saith the Lord of hosts, 
that I'll cut off the names of the idols out of the land. They shall be no more remembered. I will cause the prophets and the unclean spirit to pass out of the land. There's not going to be any more false idols. All the false gods are going to be done away with. In verse 2, because the real Savior, the real Messiah, the real God has come on the scene in Jesus Christ. Verse 3, it shall come to pass that when they, any shall yet prophesy, that his father and his mother that began him shall say unto him, Thou shalt not live, for thou speakest lies in the name of the Lord. Meaning, they're not doing it in the name of the false God that they serve. They're making these prophesies and honoring Jehovah God with it, which is a lie, a false uh, prophecy. And he said, and his father and his mother that begat him shall thrust him through. So there's not going to be no more false idols, no more false prophets. God's going to get rid of them. Even the mom and the dad are going to do it. Verse 4, it shall come to pass in that day that the prophet shall be ashamed of every one of his vision. For their false visions, for their false prophecy. When he had prophesied, neither shall they wear a rough garment to deceive, meaning that they would show themselves in sackcloth and ashes as in mourning, but not going to do that no more, because God's not spoke to them. Verse 5, but he shall say, I am no prophet, and the husbandman, for man taught me to keep cattle from my youth. Or in other words, going to be honest about who we are and what our job is. Verse 6, and one shall say unto him, what are these wounds in thine hands? When he shall answer those with which I was wounded in the house of my friends. As hurriedly as I got through all of the five verses that I just covered, I want to take just a moment with verse 6. This is what Jesus suffered in the house of his friend. He came to the Jews, John chapter 1, and the Jews refused. He came to his own, and his own received him not. But as many as received him to them, gave me the power to become the sons of God. God. Amen. Now he was in the house of his friends, his disciples, the Jewish people, the scribes, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, by Pontius Pilate, the puppet governor of, of Rome. Amen. That he received. It's talking about Jesus being crucified, paying an awful price for my sins and for your sins tonight. Amen. And so these, what are those, these wounds in your hands? Amen. He shall answer those with which I was wounded in the house of my friends. Have you ever seen the little plaque that they sell now or a postcard or a bumper sticker of, of the things that matter? Faith, family, friends, or friends, family, and faith. Amen. That's exactly what got Jesus crucified. You think about that, amen? That's one thing that keeps us strong in the Lord. Amen? The reason that I do it, I want to be a good influence on my grandchildren. I want to continue to be a good influence upon my children. I want to be a good influence on my neighbors and on those I work with tonight. Amen? And so, yeah, family, faith, our friends, all of those things, I want to be a good, but that's what got Jesus crucified. The Jewish people and their faith. Denied Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. His family, they didn't accept him as Lord and Savior. And his friends turned against him when he was brought out of the Garden of Gethsemane. You think about all of those things. Let's go on. He said, awake, O sword, against my shepherd. Talking about Jesus again. That he's going to be crucified against the man that is my fellow. Jesus is his fellow. Say the Lord of hosts, smite the shepherd, Jesus. And the sheep, the disciples, shall be scattered. The sheep and the Christian, the disciples, and shall be scattered. I will turn my hand upon the little ones. And yet God's going to have mercy. He's going to turn his hand, protect the little ones tonight. God's going to have mercy upon them. Even in a time of judgment. Yet there will be a remnant saved. Then go on to verse 8 and 9. I'm going to close. It shall come to pass in all the land, said the Lord. Two parts shall therein shall be cut off and die. But the third shall be left. There ain't. There's going to be a great destruction. Amen. There's been already to those who call themselves the children of God and God's judgment is going to separate. And then he said, and I will bring the third part by faith, those that are trusting him through the fire and refine them as silver is refined. The only way that you can refine silver and gold is what? Putting the heat on it. Amen. And that's what makes it more pure as the dross comes up on top of it. 
They skim off that which is not silver and not gold. It's the impurities that's in the metal. They skim that off. And what's left is refined silver and gold. You know, try them as gold is tried. And they shall call on my name. Remember this morning, they didn't call upon God. I was reading that in Hosea two times in the reading that I had. They didn't call upon God. God's saying here, they're going to call upon his name. And I will hear them. When we call, if you're sincere, you're honest, and you're calling out to God, God's going to be Amen. And he said, I will say, here's God's testimony. When you call out to him for repentance, call out to him for forgiveness and mercy, it is my people that has done that. And, and they shall say, the Lord is my God. Amen. Both saved Jews and Christians, regardless where you're at, from everywhere. Amen. The word of God. Uh, we read uh, that uh, uh, Paul was not ashamed in chapter 1 of Romans. Where he said, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. For it is the power of God and the salvation to the Jew first. And also to the Greek. And so those that were the Jewish of his nation and those that were not. Our salvation is open and available for everybody. For all the whosoever wills. That's in the world today. Doesn't matter who you are. Doesn't matter what your background is. Don't matter what your nationality is, and whether you're a man or a woman, a boy or a girl, makes no difference. Jesus Christ came into this world to save sinners. Amen. That's the bottom line. And it doesn't matter what the rest of you and your identity is that makes you who you are. If you're outside, of the grace of God outside of the mercy of Jesus Christ Jesus died for you amen makes no difference who you are Jesus died for your sins you know how simple it is to get saved just to call upon his name old time conviction still believe that God's got a knock on your heart's door and when he does that's God saying you need to come you need to surrender your life to me you need to make Jesus Lord of your life as we get ready to sing an invitation number <laughs> 380